right? It is approximately 535. Uh, the virtual first virtual equity town hall uh, for the South Suburban area is about to start. For housekeeping, I would ask that everyone please mute your phones, particularly if you are on the call um, by conference line to unmute your phone, you can hit star six. For those who are on the computer for the Teams, you can click in the middle of your screen and use the microphone. We really appreciate everyone coming. My name is Lynetta Haynes-Turner. I am the Chief of Staff to President Preckwinkle. Uh, we have a robust discussion this evening planned. As I said, this is our first virtual town hall. Please bear with us as we may have technology concerns, but in the spirit of making sure that we are reaching out uh, and put, getting the critical feedback and the input from all of our residents, we wanted to have this virtual space um, this evening to give you some brief remarks and background on our COVID related response. And then we will spend the bulk of the second half of uh, this evening um, directly addressing the questions that you have submitted and some that you may have throughout the presentation. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Madam President, Cook County Board President, Tony Preckwinkle. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us tonight and welcome you to our first racial equity virtual town hall. Tonight, we're focusing on the South suburbs and we'll continue to hold town halls in the coming weeks to hear directly from residents in different regions of Cook County. I'd like to thank our commissioners representing the Southland who've joined us. Commissioner Stanley Moore, Deborah Sims and Donna Miller. I'd also like to thank Dr. Kieran Joshi, co-leader of the <coughs> Cook County Department of Public Health, and Bill Barnes, Executive Director of Cook County's Department of Emergency Management and Regional Security, who are on the line as well. My Chief of Staff, Lynetta Haynes-Turner, who you heard from earlier, is also with us this evening to MC the event and moderate the question and answer period. Together, we'll provide you with an update on Cook County's rapid response to the pandemic answer the questions during the live question and answer period after the presentations. Since last December, when we first learned of the spread of the coronavirus in Wuhan, China, Cook County began preparing for the potential spread of COVID-19 to our region. In January, emergency management and regional security in the Cook County Department of Public Health proactively worked to ensure that resources were in place to assist suburban municipalities and especially suburban first responders. In February, we began preparing for a worst case scenario to ensure that if necessary, our county workforce could work primarily from home and still carry out essential services. In March, I made a disaster proclamation so that we could access emergency funding from FEMA and so that we could work quickly to procure emergency services and supplies. I also sent most of my workforce in my administration to work from home and practice social distancing. Bill Barnes will go into it in more detail, but I can say that emergency management and security has donated over 1.8 million, 1.8 million pieces of personal protective equipment throughout Cook County since the beginning of the pandemic and has coordinated alternative housing for COVID positive residents, first responders and other essential workers. Emergency management and regional security has also coordinated with hospitals throughout the county and the medical examiner's office to assist with any resource needs. The Cook County Department of Public Health has worked diligently since its first positive case in Cook County in January to conduct contact tracing, answer resident questions through a multilingual hotline and email, continuously update community organizations throughout Cook County on a weekly basis and coordinate with the city and state on our efforts. Dr. Joshi will go into more detail on those efforts shortly. We've also made significant efforts to re reduce the population in Cook County Jail and the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center because jails are petri dishes and social distancing is just not possible under these conditions. Now let's talk about equity. I've made racial equity a priority of my administration in 2018, my office published a five-year strategic plan, a policy roadmap to guide our work. We looked at ways for government to advance equity through policy and practice. 
Last year in September, Cook County held its first ever racial equity week. Another focus of my administration has been the economic growth of the South suburbs. I've charged my senior economic development, transportation and sustainability teams to focus on the county's investments in the Southland, as well as develop a long range strategic approach to transform the South suburbs. We are seeing firsthand during the COVID-19 pandemic how glaring the inequities are. We know that in normal times, black and brown communities struggle with disinvestment access to health care, food insecurity, lack of economic opportunity, and other forms of inequity. They're only exacerbated during a public health crisis. Cook County experienced a heat wave in 1995 that resulted in more than 700 heat-related deaths. Similar to what we are seeing during this pandemic, many of those deaths were in black and brown communities. One clear reason why so many people died in that heat wave is that government did not respond to the crisis looking through an equity lens, targeting resources according to need and prioritize, prioritizing the needs of, of our most vulnerable communities, which are always communities of color. The difference between 1995 and today is that Cook County, the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois are all approaching this crisis through an equity lens and ensuring that we put the needs of our most vulnerable residents first. This also means listening to what communities need and tailoring our response to that need. The Justice Advisory Council and the Bureau of Economic Development have both sent out surveys to grantees, which include many community service providers, so that they can hear from trusted sources on what community residents and businesses most need from Cook County during this difficult time. So that's what we're here for this evening to listen to the needs of our residents directly from the residents themselves. I look forward to answering your questions. I'd like to turn it over now to Stanley Moore of the 4th District, and we'll hear in succession from the 4th District, the 5th District, and the 6th District. Thank you. Commissioner Moore. Thank you, Madam President, President Prohibwinkle, and everyone else on the line. Good evening. My name is Cook County Commissioner Stanley Moore of the 4th District. First, I want to extend my prayers to everyone on the call tonight. These are truly unprecedented times, and I know the challenges and the difficulties that we are facing as the COVID-19 evolves and continues to, I want everyone to continue to stay safe, stay prayerful, stay strong, and care for one another. I want to thank President Pretwinkle and her team and the various county departments, their leadership for, for addressing the needs of our Cook County residents in the South suburbs. I also want to acknowledge the hard work of my fellow Cook County commissioners, uh, Commissioner Sims, Commissioner Miller, to name a few. We are hard at work advocating for the best coordinated health care for our most vulnerable residents. The county is targeting resources to give an economic lift to our business community, as well as strengthen our social service efforts. Also, I'd like to real quickly before I turn the mic over, I want to talk about something that's very near and dear to me. I want to take this opportunity to thank President Pretwinkle for appointing me to serve as the chairman of the Cook County Complete Count Census Commission. Though COVID-19 has dropped, on, dropped into our laps, we were in the middle of a, a, a bright and strong campaign to make Cook County 100% counted population. But with the challenges of COVID-19, we have found ourselves uh, uh, putting the census uh, on, on a second tier. So COVID-19 has taken precedence, but we need your help. Every 10 years, the Census Bureau counts all of the people in the country and all of the people in Cook County. The census determines how that federal funding is invested in our South suburban land for our schools, K through 12, our colleges, our roads, our bridges, our transportation, our infrastructure, our social service programs, and so on and so forth. We cannot let any pandemic or anything else keep us from getting the money that we so need to fund our communities. And the only way we're going to do that is by encouraging everyone to participate. I have to make a strong push for you not to forget to make sure that we participate in this census. The 2020 census is more important this time than ever. A complete and accurate count ensures that our South Suburban communities will receive the resources 
that it so needs, especially in these times. To date, only 58% of Illinois residents have completed the census form, and only 53% of Cook County residents have filled out their census forms. That's not enough. We have to work hard to encourage everyone who has joined us to get the word out about participating in the 2020 census. The 2020 census has never been easier to complete, and we're asking you to complete it online or by phone or by mail. You can visit my2020census.gov, or you can call 844-330-2020. Thank you for your participation, and we'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Now we would ask that to Commissioner Sims. The floor is yours. Commissioner Sims. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay I am not going to show my live picture today. Was uh, don't comb your hair day, so I'm not showing my my live view of me today. But I'd like to thank President Pret Winkle for uh, putting on this uh, town and her staff for putting on this town hall meeting. It's good when we can actually talk to our constituency and our county. Uh, employees to uh, find out exactly what's going on for those things that we're not uh, downtown in our offices every day or in our district offices every day right now to uh, be able to have that actual contact with everybody. So this gives us an opportunity to find out uh, exactly what's going on. Uh, today, I was in a town hall meeting with uh, South Suburban mayors and managers, and one of the questions and concerns that they have was that one of the testing sites uh, was the self-testing. And I, I think we need to make sure that uh, in this process in the South Suburbs that everybody doesn't feel like that we're getting uh, left out of information or the information is not trickling down to us because due to the self-test, nobody understood how come, uh, you know, because the swab where they uh, stick it all the way up in your nose to do the swab, this was not being done. And uh, I guess that was some of the concerns of the people is the accuracy of the test. So as we talk to uh, everybody that's on this phone today, if you get the message out, that there are two different kinds of tests. I learned that today, uh, that <clears throat> there's one where they do do the whole nasal, I guess, uh, back to the uh, the swab where it goes back to your throat and the one where they just uh, you just swab the inside of your nose, which is, I, I forgot the word that they use for that, but uh, there are two different kinds of tests. So again, I thank you, President Prettwinkle and your staff uh, Lynetta and John and everybody else who was involved in putting this together uh, to, so that we do have this contact and, and um, are able to ask questions and voice our, our opinion. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sims. And now uh, with last but not least, Commissioner Donna Miller. Thank you, Lynetta. I appreciate being here with everyone. And thank you, Madam President, for putting this town hall together. It's great to be here with my fellow commissioners, Sims and more. So we are definitely in unprecedented times and we are working together to fight this pandemic and continue and continue our county government functions. And I wanna thank you for your leadership during this crisis, as well as all the colleagues uh, across our local state and federal partners. Um, I did want to touch on the unprecedented level of disparities in healthcare outcomes during this COVID-19 pan pandemic, especially in African-American communities in Chicago and Cook County. And as you know, the South Suburbs has been particularly hard hit by the virus. In fact, we've had 100 deaths for the last five weeks in a row, which was just reported today in the Tribune. So I've been addressing this head on, making sure that my district is getting all the available information and access to resources from all the levels of government that we have. I've also been hosting a series of Facebook Live town hall meetings that started a couple weeks ago and are continuing this week, bringing in experts from healthcare, mental health, nutrition, exercise, public safety, 
And just to educate our residents on in the Southland about the problem of healthcare disparities, COVID-19 and the social determinants of health that contribute to these disparities. Additionally, my office has been reaching out to our seniors with wellness calls to make sure they don't need anything. I've also been able to distribute much needed PPE to some of our local long-term care facilities with Congresswoman Kelly just this week. And as we know, they're in short supply and what is truly needed by our first responders and frontline healthcare workers, especially in congregant settings, which we're gonna hear more and more about as time goes on that have been hard hit by the virus. We also know that African-American residents in Illinois are five times more likely to die of COVID-19 than their white counterparts. And there exists an extremely large disparity in the number of both cases and deaths related to the new coronavirus based on race. African-Americans are disproportionately impacted by some of the underlying conditions that have affected the severity of the virus, including chronic kidney and cardiovascular disease, asthma and obesity and and so on and during the town halls we've tried to educate our communities on the importance of keeping their appointments with their health care providers many health care providers have mentioned that people are afraid to come to the doctor's office because they're afraid they're going to get coronavirus but they have to keep up on these chronic diseases because they don't want to worsen them and be more susceptible to COVID-19 and exacerbate those underlying conditions. During one of my recent town halls, I had Dr. Althea Maybank, who's the chief equity officer of the American Medical Association, and she called these healthcare disparities racism. The crisis has shined a light on the causes of this disparity, which are rooted in generations of systematic disadvantages in healthcare delivery and health access in communities of color and African community, African American communities in particular. And so Madam President, I'm looking forward to continuing your work on racial equity with our colleagues and our healthcare partners, not only to address this crisis, but to continue to improve and address these inequities that still exist in our government and workplaces in society that have led to unacceptable outcomes. Lastly, I believe it's important to stress the racial equity applies to everyone and can be multi-generational. I'm proud to say that, although I always say that my family has worked and lived and thrived in Cook County for over 100 years, racial equity and diversity has always been a cornerstone of those beliefs and they instilled that in me. So we have much more in common than we don't when we are a group of people who work together to our full potential to address these barriers. And I look forward to continuing those work to remove these barriers as the county and state and country are working together to make take advantage of this as we continue to develop the strengths of each individual and culture that we can bring to the table. So I look forward to discussion from our constituents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Miller. Those are certainly sobering statistics. Uh, I don't know necessarily that uh, some of us on the phone, um, we probably have heard some of those, but it's certainly good to have that perspective as we continue this evening to really talk about how Cook County is responding to those numbers. And so uh, for the rest of this evening, we have brief presentations from uh, Dr. Joshi, who uh, is our um, co-senior medical officer at Cook County Department of Public Health. He will talk a little bit more specifically about what Cook County Department of Public Health is doing to uh, do their part um, in helping to eliminate some of those racial inequities as it relates to the COVID crisis. And then it will be followed by a brief response um, to um, what our emergency management team is doing to connect our residents and our municipalities by our director, uh, Bill Barnes of uh, Department of Emergency Management and Regional Security. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Joshi. Thank you so much, Ms. Haynes Turner. Um, hello, I'm Kieran Joshi. I'm Dr. Kieran Joshi. I'm a senior medical officer and co-director of the Cook County Department of Public Health. I'm so glad to be with you today for this virtual town hall. Thank you, Madam President, for gathering us for this conversation. Thank you, commissioners, and thank you to all of you who are attending this evening. The Cook County Department of Public Health is the state-certified public health department for almost all of suburban Cook County. 
the cities of Chicago, Evanston, Oak Park, Skokie, and Stickney Township are all served by their own state certified health departments. Our work, whether it's investigating communicable disease, case managing high risk infants, or preventing tobacco use is always focused, always on advancing health equity for all people. It's in our DNA and it's in our very mission. We want to, next slide please. We want to give folks on the call a sense of all the work that CCDPH has been doing in response to COVID-19 and highlight the health equity approach that drives what we do. This slide shows you some of the data from our Shiny app, which provides data on the numbers of cases and rates of infections in the suburban municipalities in our jurisdiction. We're really proud of being able to provide access to these numbers to community members and to provide that data in ways that allow us to analyze rates by race to identify disparities in cases and outcomes. Our goal is to shine a light on this issue. Our app links to the medical examiner's office death data that you'll hear about a little bit more in a moment. Next slide. We wanted to touch on these other aspects of our work during the COVID-19 pandemic to give you a sense of the entirety of our emergency response. We're highlighting our emergency response, but know that these activities are ongoing. Our response builds on the equity focused work that we do that our staff does every single day. So first infection control. Our communicable disease staff works every single day to help contain the spread of COVID-19, particularly in congregate settings like nursing homes. We're in contact with more than 130 facilities across our jurisdiction to provide assessments, give guidance, and help them make the changes that they need to keep their residents and their staff safe. In collaboration with the state of Illinois, we're working with volunteer strike teams to provide more intensive support and on the ground guidance to the most impacted long term care facilities, most of which are in communities of color. Contact tracing. You may have heard about contact tracing in the news. This is the bread and butter of public health, and it's the work that we do to gather information from people who are positive cases and their contacts. Information gathered during investigations may include current symptoms, exposure history, work history, and household contacts, along with their current status. Collecting this data helps to mitigate the spread of disease and informs our response efforts. Our health equity approach to this work prioritizes those most vulnerable during the pandemic. Again, currently those in the congregate settings I mentioned earlier. Workplace safety and violations. We're working with the Illinois Attorney General's Office to address complaints about workplace safety and violations. When we investigate a complaint, we conduct or work with community health inspectors to conduct assessments, either on site or by telephone. And we provide technical assistance to businesses about things like implementing social distancing in the workplace, precautions to take for ill workers, and other policies that they can implement to improve safety for their staff. Alternate housing. We've established alternate housing, working with our good friend, Bill Barnes, at the Department of Emergency Management and Regional Security, who you'll hear from shortly. Together, we've established a pool of hotel rooms to serve medically stable, low-risk individuals who have COVID and are being discharged from the hospital or their families if they cannot isolate at home. I'm pleased to say we're also able to offer respite housing to the first responders, healthcare workers, and correctional officers who are putting their lives on the line. Community engagement. Our community engagement team is collaborating with key community stakeholders and service providers to share critical COVID-19 information and connect residents, especially those in our most vulnerable communities, to resources to keep them safe and to keep them healthy. They host regular meetings with our Southland co-design group. This is a group of community residents who are grassroots leaders in their neighborhoods who weigh in on community needs and help inform our work. Lastly, communications. We have new COVID-19 web pages on our site with information on things like symptoms, testing, guidance for families, workplaces, and healthcare settings. We're in the process of translating all of those pages into Spanish to make them accessible to our Latino community. 
We also push information out to the community through Facebook and Twitter. Our website has had more than half a million page views since the end of January, and our Facebook posts have gathered more than 1.1 million impressions since the end of January. Next slide. Finally, we wanted to ensure that all of you were aware that this work is being conducted with an eye on the data and the recognition of how this pandemic is playing out in communities in suburban Cook County. We're deeply troubled by the disparities we're seeing. There are considerably higher rates of COVID-19 illnesses and deaths amongst African Americans. Barriers to testing and incomplete data for race and ethnicity may be masking the degree to which these disparities appear in the data, particularly for the Hispanic population. In suburban Cook County, our jurisdiction, the rate per 100,000 for non-Hispanic Black residents is about three times that of our white population. In the south suburbs, where communities are, our populations are predominantly African American, the rate of COVID-19 is two and a half times higher than the predominantly white, white suburbs in the north of the county. We know that African Americans have historically had higher rates of the underlying conditions that are a result of years of racist policies like redlining, limited access to health insurance and health care, and community disinvestment. These are the conditions that put people at increased risk for severe illness, complications, and death from COVID-19. COVID-19 has been talked about as an illness or a disease or an epidemic that's unmasking or revealing the health, the health disparities that we've long known are rooted in historical racism and discrimination. And even worse, COVID-19 is likely to worsen or deepen the disparities even further if we don't work together to address the inequities that unjustly affect some of our most vulnerable residents. While we need to focus on the particular methods to keep us all safe in the short term, like social distancing, we need to also continue to advance progressive social policy focused on the structural determinants of health, like paid sick leave and increases in the minimum wage that will reduce inequities in the long term. Our health department is committed to reducing structural racism, a root cause of health inequities, and to advocate for pro-equity policies to protect and enhance physical and mental health. That ends my slides, but I wanted to end with just some ways that you can continue to connect with our health department. Feel free to call our hotline from Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at 708-633-3319. Visit our website, Facebook, or Twitter, or email us at ccdph.covid19 at Cook County HHS. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Director Barnes. Yes, good evening. And thanks, Lynetta. And thank you, uh, Madam President, and our elected officials, the commissioners who represent uh, the Southland, your guidance uh, as we move forward in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And also thanks to you, Dr. Joshi, for your really thoughtful words. Um, they, I think he does a really good job of identifying how the county's response to the COVID-19 pandemic is really truly focused on racial equity and ensuring that the people that need our help the most uh, get it. So if you could advance to the next slide, I just wanna help you all understand um, who, who I am, but more importantly, what I do. Um, as indicated, I'm the director of the county's Department of Emergency Management and Regional Security. We are the county's emergency manager. So what does that mean? What is emergency management? Emergency management um, is the is the skill set or the profession that you know anticipates and, and addresses risks and dangers from all types of hazards that might face the county. Those might be natural disasters such as floods or tornadoes, and all the way up to a pandemic such as what we are currently experiencing. But boil it down at the end of the day, EMRS uh, is tasked with making sure that that the county, its government, its residents, and its municipalities have the tools they need um, to prepare for, respond to, and recover from whatever might be coming its way. And we take a whole community approach. And as I walk through um, the slides and, and give you a little more information, 
you know, I hope you'll come away from this appreciating how we are using the information that is that is um, being generated during this pandemic to drive our response and make sure that that the folks in the communities that are most um, disparately impacted by by this pandemic are receiving the attention and uh, the resources they need. So we plan for things like tornadoes and floods. And as the slide indicates, COVID-19 is like any other disaster, but it is much, much larger. Where we, where we deal typically with flooding uh, on the Des Plaines River, that typically impacts one or two uh, jurisdictions, one or two towns, and we're easy, able to easily marshal uh, the resources we need to, to, to combat that flood. But here, every single municipality, every single county, every single state, and every single nation uh, around the world is suffering from the same disaster, which makes things all the more hard to, to handle. So partnership is key to fighting this pandemic. We as a county can't go this alone. Certainly none of the municipalities uh, in Cook County could go this alone. We all need to rely upon each other. And the way we ensure that we as a county are tackling this problem in, in the most a collaborative manner is we have what's known as the Cook County Emergency Operations Center. This is the nerve center of the county's response to a disaster, including a pandemic. And, and I must add that, you know, this is a, a unique disaster in that it's a public health emergency. This isn't a, a, your normal flood or tornado. So we are working very closely with Dr. Joshi and his, his team at Cook County Department of of public health in a unified manner um, to identify, uh, assess, and and sort of solve the problems that are coming along um, in this pandemic. And it's key that they are an integral part of our, our emergency operations center. But in addition to Cook County Department of Public Health, we have over 40 agencies, both at the local level uh, the state level, Illinois Emergency Management Agency, Illinois Department of Public Health, and even the federal level, uh, where we have Illinois National Guardsmen who are helping us out and FEMA uh, providing technical and resource assistance as well. At the end of the day, we have one single goal. The folks that are here at the EOC, both virtually and, and or, or physically, and that's to anticipate and respond to the needs of the county, its government, residents, and municipalities. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, I'll just identify sort of you know what we have been doing out of the Emergency Operations Center. As Dr. Joshi said, one of the key needs that we all identified was that for alternative housing. Um, housing for those people who were being discharged uh, from the from the hospital or who have been diagnosed with COVID positive as with COVID-19 that are asymptomatic, that don't require medical care, but for whatever reason, can't go home. They live in a multi-generational home where they fear um, exposing their, their grandparents and parents to, to the disease. Um, they are housing unstable, they, or they just lack the space um, to separate from their family. I saw an interesting quote in the paper the other day that is, you know, the ability to isolate is a privilege. And there are many, many people in this county who do not have the ability just to physically separate themselves from the people that they live with. So this housing is made available uh, to those individuals. We also have housing, as Dr. Joshi said, for respite housing for our first uh, first responders, our healthcare, uh, the folks who work in the long-term uh, healthcare facilities, such as nursing homes and congregate um, locations. These people are on the front lines every day fighting this fight and last thing we want to do is for them to take whatever they're exposed to in the workplace home to their families. So if we're able to give them a, 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 a safe harbor in the storm and give them the opportunity to sleep in a hotel room at night, as opposed to with, um, exposing their family to a disease, um, we, we're, we're happy to do so as a county. From a returning citizen standpoint, we are working closely uh, with the Cook County Sheriff's Office, with the Public Defender's Office, with the state's attorney and the Justice Advisory Council to uh, safely depopulate the jail. Um, Madam President often refers to the jail as our cruise ship, and it's such a, a, a profound uh, statement because that is the, the our 
our petri dish, our, our location where we have people confined who can't leave. And once the disease gets into the jail, it's very difficult to get it out. So the, the more we can depopulate the, the jail safely to allow for the detainees in the jail to, to safely social, socially isolate, the better. So we have housing in place to accommodate uh, some of the individuals coming out of the jail and then um, allow them to go on to more permanent housing and then homeless shelters. Um, one of the things about this pandemic, and, and maybe that's a silver lining, but it is really shining a light on the inequities that exist in society, not just in, in our county, but around the world. And we have rapidly realized that there are social networks and social uh, safety nets that have been systematically dismantled over the years through various um, decisions um, in in uh, in Washington that have made these populations, the homeless populations, much more vulnerable. And we are doing our best to support the, the existing homeless shelters uh, in the suburban Cook County regions to ensure that they have the space, uh, the funding, and the staffing that they need to care for this population. Support for the medical examiner's office. This a grim reality of this pandemic is that uh, many people will unfortunately succumb to the disease. Um, they will they will die at, at rates much greater than the medical examiner's office is used to uh, handling and has the capacity and facilities to handle. So early on in this pandemic, we identified the need to stand up a surge center so that we could uh, safely accept um, fat fatalities related to the pandemic from the hospitals around the region and, and store them so that the bodies and, and our loved ones were treated with the dignity and respect that they, they so deserve. And then finally, direct support to 135 municipalities. This is something that we do 365 days a year. We are in constant contact with your municipalities. They have direct lines of communication with us so that we know what they need as soon as they need it and we respond uh, directly to them. That is no different now than it is uh, in January when we, one couldn't even manage, uh, imagine this pandemic. As, as Madam President indicated, we've distributed almost 2 million individual pieces of personal protective equipment, the masks, the gloves, the, the face shields that our first responders and our healthcare workers so desperately need in order to continue to do their job. We have provided technical support directly to our municipalities to ensure that um, they're aware of the federal dollars that will ultimately become available to them to reimburse them for their response efforts. And we're helping them to track their response costs so that they can best position themselves to um, you know, receive the maximum amount of federal dollars that ultimately we, we anticipate will be made. And then finally, from a, from a communication standpoint, um, we have this alert cook. Um, this is a great way for you to be linked directly to messaging from the Cook County government. If you text alert cook to 888-777, you will be signed up and receive um, routine updates um, from the county as it relates to what we're doing. So, you know, this is a, a town hall about equity. So how are we being equitable in what we are doing? Well, um, a lot of the, the majority of what we're doing is in direct response to inquiries and asks from our municipalities. So the, the municipalities in the Southlands that need PPE for their first responders, we understand that, we hear them, and we fill them as, as rapidly as possible. From a medical examiner standpoint, we recognize we, in consultation with Dr. Joshi and, and Cook County Department of Public Health, we anticipated that there would be increased deaths in the South suburbs um, in the county. So we pre-positioned a number of trailers to, to facilitate our um, mass fatality plan to, to anticipate um, a surge in fatalities in those areas. But more importantly, what we're doing is data-driven. And Dr. Joshi you know, spoke to his Shiny app, um, and, and there are other resources that we're using. There's a social vulnerability index um, that is a map that's publicly available that helps us to identify those areas in the county um, that lack resources uh, and, and are most, most likely to need our services. So we, we proactively target those municipalities. 
we reach out to those municipalities, make sure that they have what they need, that we understand their needs and can and and can move on those needs proactively as opposed to reactively. Thank you, Bill. We are going to um, move forward. Uh, we have about 15 minutes uh, and we want to provide an opportunity for our residents to and those who are on the phone to ask any questions. Um, I would like to start with just saying, how can we help you? What is the information that you've heard this evening that resonated with you? Maybe it's something that you didn't know that the county was working on. Uh, maybe it's a specific question about the services that may be provided directly to you. We know um, that in addition to our government response and what you've heard as it relates to our public health response and our emergency management response, we are also working um, to make sure that we are doing our best to mitigate the challenges that COVID has presented in your lives whether that's individuals who have lost their jobs uh, and they are struggling to identify and, and um, secure unemployment um, or trying to identify other jobs that you could be doing during this COVID period. Um, help for our small businesses who are struggling now, um, given the closure. Uh, and quite frankly, also looking at um, other assistance such as rental assist assistance uh, for those who are renting and mortgage assistance for those who have homes. So we want to continue to talk through those things. We will be presenting more information specifically about what we're doing in those areas, but I wanna open it up to the floor for any questions from our guests. And recall, you can unmute your phones by hitting star six if you are on the conference line, or if you're on the computer, you can hit the uh, middle of the screen and unmute yourself. Uh, this is Felix, the chair of home nurses. Can I go ahead? Yes, please, Felix. Uh, yes, ma'am, my question, Madam President, um, we're seeing a lot of um, Felix. We're having difficulty hearing you. Another option is to okay. go ahead. Felix, we're having some troubles hearing you. If you okay, like, you, you can. Enough. You can type into the chat box. We're having some technical difficulties hearing your question. But if you type okay, it into the I'll chat function, that. yes, please. Yes, you can proceed on typing in. All right, thank you. Other questions or comments from our residents? There's a question from Kiana Williams. Are there any resources available to help with public transportation? Not to my knowledge. So uh, in answer to that question, I, I was told earlier today that the CTA was offering free um, service uh, mm -hmm. in the immediate, but um, many of you may have heard that we have been um, working with the transit partners across the region to identify um, ways to have an integrated fare system. Uh, and to uh, help with the commutes in terms of the cost of commuting, particularly in the South and the South suburban area. So there is nothing now, but we are certainly talking about uh, the regional transportation system and making sure that we are identifying resources, particularly as we start uh, transitioning back to work for many of you. So please stay tuned. Uh, we will have more information in the coming weeks, okay? There is another question. How are you going to minimize the population of the jails? What is the plan to keep them safe? And I'm wondering if there's anyone from the Justice Advisory Council that is on the call this evening to address that question. If not, I will. Okay. All right, so I will address that question. Certainly the president uh, addressed it early on in her remarks. Uh, we have been working with all of the criminal justice stakeholders that include the state's attorneys, the uh, public defender's office, the sheriff's office, the chief judge's office, and the clerk's office, along with the president's office to try to minimize and safely release individuals from the jail 
as you, some of you may know, many of the detainees currently in the jail are there pre-trial, which means that they are still awaiting their day in court, so they have not been convicted of a crime. We are trying to be strategic and we're trying to be coordinated in releasing those individuals who are there on low level bonds. So they are simply there because they can't afford to pay to get out. Uh, and others who may have underlying health conditions, that is an ongoing process. Uh, we have much more work to do, but I will say that we have been able over the course of the last month um, to release safely um, uh, almost 27, almost 30% of the population. Pre-COVID, we had a population that hovered around 5,500, um, and now we have a population that is just hitting 4,000. So as I said, there's more work to do um, to re safely release those individuals who can be released and supporting the sheriff and CIRMAC um, who provides the health care services to all detainees um, to make sure that we are able to socially distance, provide sanitation supplies for all of those individuals who have to remain behind the wall. Other questions? This is Apostle Carl White. Um, is the county doing anything uh, to help supply food uh, in some way and, 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 and cleaning materials for, for those uh, seniors and people who are calling saying they need uh, supplies and stuff like that don't have the money to get? Uh, hey, Lynetta, it's Bill Barnes. I, I could take a crack at this if you don't mind. Yes, uh, please. So, sir, it's a great question. And um, I'm happy to announce that uh, we have, we as a county have a great uh, working relationship with the Greater Chicago Food Depository. Um, they uh, have, you know, even in, even in, in good times, they, un it's unfortunate that they serve well over 800 families on, on a daily basis. And that number has increased drastically um, as a result of the economic downturn here. So we are working with them to ensure that that food donations get to them. Um, we are working with them to increase the um, outreach that they do in the in the municipalities and townships where they don't have existing relationships. And I would strongly urge for that you know the populations that you address that you look to the to the shelters and the and the and the pantries in those municipalities as a resource uh, because we're 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 working directly with Greater Chicago Food Depository to ensure that that the the food and, and the resources they need um, are available. And Madam President, would you like to also address this question, um, given the timeliness of, of the, the um, activity that you had earlier today? Uh, thank you very much. No, yesterday we had a, a press conference actually at the Greater Chicago Food Depository talking about the long term partnership between Cook County and uh, the depository. We have um, uh, been working with them, I think since 2015, and they have brought their trucks to our clinics and distributed uh, food and, and particularly fresh produce. I think 600,000 pounds of, uh, of fresh produce in that, in that uh, little, little less than five year period. So we're very grateful to the depository for its good work. And uh, I would suggest I, I'm sorry, I don't know their website off the top of my head, but it's Greater Chicago Food Depository, and you can contact them for food pantries in your community. Um, they have seen an increase of about 40% in, uh, in utilization of our pantries and soup kitchens since the beginning of the pandemic. So, uh, and they, they have geared up to meet that challenge. We're very grateful to them. Their, their um, website is Chicago's foodbank.org. Chicago with an S, foodbank.org. That's how you can reach them. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I am looking in the chat function. There is a question from Dr. Ansel Johnson. Are there any local resources for independent African-American health providers and diabetes educators that have been forced to greatly reduce their patient services? Uh, Dr. Joshi, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, hi, this is Dr. Joshi. I think that's a great question. You know, we do have a partnership with um, the local area uh, agency on aging through which we had been providing 
uh, diabetes self-management programs. Um, I, I understand that you know a lot of those programs have been forced to scale back given COVID-19, but I also know that many providers across the jurisdiction and really across the country have been doing a lot of incredible work with telemedicine. So um, I admit I don't have a specific answer to, to your question, but I'm happy to circle back to that group um, and inquire uh, what's happening with them. That'll be great. This is Dr. Ansel Johnson here. So <clears throat> that's one thing that we do. We have a group of people and even in the home health. And we also have a digital format too with an app that we provide not only telemedicine, but also to monitor um, patients' vitals if they can record them. So, <clears throat> but we, again, we've had to curtail our services quite a bit and uh, it's just hard to maintain at this time. So I was just saying, if you all network with other, and there are a number of other independent practitioners out there too. Um, that do great work. Thank I, you, Doug. Thank you. Okay. All no, right. No. So go ahead. Uh, Next question. No. Mayor Allsbury from Village of Hazelcrest. How are you doing, Madam President? Um, my, my question has to do as we are now transitioning into uh, individuals wearing masks as they go into the stores, and as we get to the end of May, and it's going to be more of a requirement. Um, can we, and we've been talking about this in the South Suburbs, have some education to the uh, managers of the stores, individuals, because some of our millennials, they're wearing masks that's just covering their mouths. Uh, again, uh, uh, the correct way to wash your hands, uh, just some, uh, maybe some public service announcements or some, uh, some type of information that we can relay uh, to uh, store owners as we begin to walk in there. And then just to millennials in a, in a correct way to sanitize your hands with soap and water. Yes, thank you very much um, for that. Uh, I am going to ask our Bureau Chief of uh, Economic Development, Soshi Flores, to respond both to that question as well as to some of the questions directed regarding additional uh, ways um, that uh, we are supporting South Cook County uh, with accessible resources, similar to some of the resources being provided uh, from the city of Chicago. So Soshi. You're a little low, Soshi, if you could it, um, increase the volume of your phone. Is that better? A little. Is that better? Yes, that is much better. Thank you. Perfect. Good evening. This is Soshi Flores, and I'm the Bureau Chief of Economic Development. Over the last few weeks, we have been working very closely with commissioners in the south suburbs to identify needed resources that um, can strengthen the support to small businesses with the, within the south suburbs. Specifically, um, we've been working with some national partners that include the American Business Immigration Coalition, the National Partnership for New Americans, and the Illinois Restaurant Association to really provide one-on-one -on -one assistance to our small businesses to um, help them navigate through applying for the Paycheck Protection Program. So we've um, really been doing one-on-one -on -one hand-holding with regards to that program. But in addition, the Southland Development Authority as well as the Women's Business Development Center have been working very closely with us over this past week in particular as um, the funding for the PPP program has still been made available. So we've been working closely with them to um, link small businesses with the necessary resources and community banks so that they can quickly access that funding. So we're continuing to work with the commissioner. So we appreciate the partnership with the commissioners that are linking us with these small businesses in order to get them that needed technical assistance. And we will continue to develop and strengthen the ecosystem of support for small businesses, specifically within the South suburbs. That's an area that we have been working very closely with our commissioners and other um, elected officials within the area to understand the dynamic needs of that area and to incentivize development and larger scale development into our South suburbs. So we'll continue to do that and to find additional resources, especially during this recovery period. 
Thank you, Soshi. So there are uh, a number of ways um, to get in contact with us, and we will uh, provide that information at the end. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but I also want to make sure that we are able to take several more questions. And so Felix, um, who had some technological difficulties earlier, uh, I am going to read his question, and this is probably directed for Dr. Joshi. Um, can local home health agencies be given the opportunity to assist with patients being released who are not in the county network yet. This will relieve current pressure on hospitals. Dr. Joshi. Thank you. I, I would have to defer this question actually to colleagues at the health system. Um, I, I'm sure they're open to discussion and I, I'd encourage you to reach out to them. Okay. All right. Can you, and we will provide that contact information for the hospital. All right. There is one additional question, uh, and this is from Kyla Williams. The governor's plan was really broad, so it was difficult to determine when certain county offices, such as the clerk's office, will reopen. Is there a county plan for reopening available? Thank you very much, Kyla. That is a very timely question. We are um, in the midst of uh, planning for a phased approach for our reopening. Um, our, the offices of the president is working very closely with all of our separately elected offices. And for the audience, we have 11 separately elected offices uh, that span Cook County. Uh, we have been working very closely with them with our Bureau of Asset Management, who is responsible for our facilities and the maintenance of our courthouses, our public house, our, our public facilities. And I'd ask whoever to please mute your phone. Uh, and we are also um, working in tandem with the Bureau of Asset Management along with our Bureau of Human Resources. So this week we have started to have a number of meetings with our public safety stakeholders and our separately elected offices, including the clerk's office, to make sure that when, in fact, we reopen, we do so in a gradual phased approach. So not everyone is going to come back into the county facilities uh, once the governor's stay-at-home order is lifted. We want to make sure that we are following public health guidelines, that we are able to safely social distance, and that we are creating a safe environment both for our employees and all of the members of the public who come in and out of our county facilities on county business. We anticipate that we will have a full plan in the next few weeks, and we will certainly put that on our website. So please check back in um, towards the end of May for that full plan. I will also say that we will make sure that we are communicating not only to our employees, but also to the general public. So you will see the Madam President um, in a press conference announcing the county's plan. Um, we will have information on our Facebook account and other social media channels, and we will also be issuing a press conference. So you will see that information as it becomes available. We have time for one additional question before we wrap up. Anyone else on the call that would like to ask a question or have a comment? Okay, there's one more, Leah Fox. Will the county offer any assistance or relief on property tax deadlines? Madam President, would you like to answer that and close us off out with brief remarks? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to understand that the county collects property taxes not just on our behalf, not just on Cook County government's behalf, but on behalf of every city, town, village, every school district, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, every mosquito abatement district, every lighting district. So our charge is to assess property and to collect property taxes. Uh, it's our intention to send the property tax bills out in a timely fashion. We're looking at ways in which we might help those who are in distress, but we will send the bills out on time. And most of the property tax uh, comes in from escrow accounts held by banks. So that's true of both residential property and commercial and industrial property. So we would we would continue. Our plan is to to get the property tax bills out by the first of July, collect the money by August first. Uh, but we're looking at possible provisions for people who are in distress. I want to thank you all for joining us. I'm very grateful to my Chief of Staff, Lynetta Haynes-Turner, for 
for uh, emceeing. Bill Joshi, who joined us, uh, and uh, and to Soshi Flores, the head of our Bureau of Economic Development, who was available to answer questions. So thank you all. Thank you all and stay tuned for additional information and here's uh, key information and ways to stay connected to us um, as things evolve. There will be more information on our website. Please make sure you um, look and sign up for Alert Cook, which gives you real time updates um, from the public health uh, and everything else that we're doing at the county. Uh, remind you again that the Cook County Department of Public Health a hotline is at 708-633. 3319 and you can email any additional questions to ccdph.covid19 at cookcountyhhs.org. Please have a wonderful evening and a great weekend. Thank you.